Good morning and um, welcome everyone to this second week of classes, second uh, week of uh, doing this course, BC110 on uh, identity in Christ. Um, I know of, uh, people are connecting right now. Just uh, let them come in. All right. Um, so good morning, everyone, once again. Let's take a moment just to pray, and then we will get started. Just pray together, and uh, we will have a wonderful time uh, just uh, drawing out of the Word of God, drawing out of God's uh, heart. Let's pray together. Um, just want to invite someone um, to please uh, unmute your mic and um, just lead us in a word of prayer and just lead us in prayer. Let's pray. I pray, I pray that by our instructor to know the depth of your God and by our life and recognize Jesus, by which the Father may be glorified. I pray in the precious name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, um, thank you, Ruby. Uh, we, we didn't uh, necessarily hear uh, all of it, but thank you. Thank you for leading us. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to uh, just quickly review what we did uh, uh, last week when we got started, and then we will go forward in our class today in uh, things we wish to cover. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can uh, together look at the notes and then um, just quickly review uh, what we did uh, last week. So as we introduced this course on our identity in Christ, you know, this is one of the most important revelations in New Testament scripture uh, by Paul, primarily through Paul and then through uh, the other apostles, God has unveiled for us what he has done for the new creation in Christ. And this is so important for every believer, for us to understand this truth of our identity, our inheritance and our life in Christ and to live out of that. So, as a class, uh, as we journey through this course, um, this semester, uh, I want each one of us to be able to really uh, assimilate this truth, this revelation, receive it into your heart, your life, and then impart it to other people. You know, you need to know this so well so that you will be able to teach it and you will be able to impart it to other people, you know, in your area, in your communities. and share the truth uh, with God's people, because many believers, many of God's people, uh, they're good people, uh, but they haven't received this revelation. They don't know this truth uh, of the new creation, who we are in Christ. And so uh, we must help them understand it. We need to be able to share it with them so that we can all live out of our identity, our inheritance, and our life in Christ. So quickly to review, you know, we just gave the analogy of uh, uh, an orphan boy who has nothing to his name living in the slums. If he's adopted by a, you know, a, a family uh, that, that, that's wealthy, that has everything, uh, they adopt him, uh, his life completely changes. Right, because uh, now he is in total. He's been adopted and he's been accepted into this family. Uh, he has the family name. He's got everything taken care of. But this boy uh, has to change his thinking, and he has to uh, embrace what has happened in his life and live out of it. Uh, he shouldn't go back to his old life um, in the slums. Uh, if any reason he has to go to the slums, it'll be only to bring more people out from there and give them. 
a better life. So what we have said is the way God works is that he completes the work and then he invites us to live out of that. He says, I will do the work for you, which is what he did for us in Christ. And then he says, live out of what I've done for you. And that's what this study uh, is going to lead us into, to understand what God has done for us in Christ. Um, and, and then we live out of that. Um, so we must know this truth. And how will this truth change a life? It will change our self-image, the way we look at ourselves. Uh, it will change the way we relate to God in worship. Uh, it will change the way we face situations in life. Um, it will change our lifestyle. It will make us victorious people, who people will walk in dominion and authority. Uh, it will change the way we face demons. Demonic powers will not be fearful. I will not be intimidated. But Satan and his demons will tremble before us when we confront them. And it will change the way we relate to people. That we learn to look at people with love and compassion, believe what God has placed in their lives, uh, and recognize what God is doing uh, in them. So it will change the way we relate to people. Uh, ultimately, uh, we will all, you know, if we learn to walk out of who we are in Christ, we will walk just like Jesus. That's, that's the whole purpose. The reason God brought us into Christ is so that we could be like Christ. We could walk like Jesus. And that's a journey uh, we are going to make. So uh, we started this year, last week. Uh, we looked at the, some of these scriptures. I'm just quickly reviewing now. We looked at John 40, 19, 20, where Jesus foretold a time uh, when his disciples will know this revelation that, you know, he said, you will know that you are in me and I am in you. And that's uh, in John 14, verse 20. You are in me, and I am in you. You will know that. So he told them that in that day, the time is coming. And so sure enough, that revelation was given to the church through the apostles. Another way Jesus communicated this truth for us is in the picture of the wine and the branches. He said, I am the wine, you are the branches. So you know, uh, we, we, we made many important statements here. We said, you know, we are really connected to Jesus. Spiritually, we are connected to him. You are spiritually connected to Jesus. And his life is flowing in you, just as the life of the vine flows into the branches. Right? So what's in him is in you. Uh, and, and, and we bear the fruit. We express his life flowing through us. And, and that's what we are journeying to discover the life of Christ uh, in us. Then we went into this whole passage in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we read the first 14 verses, and uh, we uh, highlighted a few things from that, that passage. Uh, we said that in these 14 verses, there are about 16 descriptors of, uh, uh, of the believer in Christ. It says, you know, Paul says, uh, this is who you are in Christ. You're blessed, you're chosen, uh, you're holy, you're blameless, you're covered in love, you're predestined, you're adopted, you're a people. People of praise. Um, having said that, we, you know, we, uh, we, we need to affirm God's word for our lives, that this is who we are. We are who we are in Christ is who we really are. And I want to encourage you to say that very often, you know, uh, make that a part of your life uh, every day or every so often. Just declare, you know, who I am in Christ is who I really am. That's my identity. That describes my inheritance. And that's the life I live. I live out of who I am in Christ. You know, um, so learn to um, live out of that. Let me just see if I think there are a lot of people waiting here. We just admit all of them. Okay. Everyone's done. Okay. Um, 
Can you all hear me okay? Is my audio okay? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, okay, so welcome everyone. I'm just gonna go back to um, sharing the PDF and um, kid follow with me there. All right, so learn to affirm these things about yourself, you know, and I've just given a little summary here uh, on page 10. And uh, you know, you, you and I can, as we go through the scriptures, I want you to take a hold of these things and say, this is who I am, who I am in Christ. That's who I really am, right? Don't let other people define your identity. You know, people may call you smart and people may call you foolish. People may call you, you know, this or that or whatever. And different people will have different opinions about you. But your identity is not based on somebody else's opinion about you. Your identity is based on who you are in Christ, on who God has made you to be in Christ. So you and I must just be firm in that, right? My identity is who I am in Christ, and I'm going to live out of that. Right? So you learn to say, and I'm blessed with every blessing from God. I am chosen. I am holy. I'm set apart. I'm blameless without fault and righteous in his sight. I'm covered in his love. I'm totally loved by the Father. Um, I'm predestined according to his purposes. And I'm adopted as a child in his family. I'm a, I'm a person for his praise, displaying his glory. Uh, I'm accepted in the beloved. You know, I'm redeemed by his blood. I am forgiven uh, in Jesus. Uh, I'm a recipient of his uh, abounding grace. Um, I'm part of those who are, have been gathered in Jesus. I have a rich spiritual inheritance in Jesus. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm his purchased possession. You, know, you learn to say these things about yourself. Um, you don't have to uh, uh, say it in front of other people. You're not trying to impress other people. When you it's strengthening you, your inner man. It's strengthening you, your understanding and your acceptance of these truths. And also it's a powerful, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing for God to hear you say that, that, you know, uh, God hears our confession. He hears what we say. And so he says, yeah, this child is, is accepting my word. This child is accepting what I've done for him or her. Uh, you know, so you affirm that. And also it's a, and we affirm this, it's a powerful weapon against the enemy, right? We overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So we need to testify to what God has done. Right? So testify these things. So some of the things we highlighted as we progressed was we said this is a finished work. You know, many of these things that, that we saw in this passage are in the past or present tense. That means, you know, he has blessed us. He already chose us. He already predestined us. We have been accepted. We are redeemed. We have obtained inheritance. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So these are things God has already done. He's not, you know, planning to do that for us sometime in the future. He says, look, I've already done this for you. It's completed. It's a finished work in Christ. So we need to learn to live out of that finished work. Um, another thing we emphasized last week is that this is something that is done for us in heavenly places. That means it is, it is in the spiritual realm. This is a spiritual reality. So just like in the natural, we all have, uh, you know, our identity, you know, we've all been born into some household, we live in some part of the world. Um, uh, we've had, we have our own, each one of us have our, you know, different uh, social bringing, cultural upbringing, uh, some sort of an education, some sort of a profession, all those things, you know, we have in the natural but and those are realities in the natural but in the spiritual your reality is defined by who you are in christ that's your spiritual identity that's your spiritual inheritance and just as in the natural 
you know, we go about and people ask you who you are and which family you're from, where you live. You know, you say those things, you know, in the natural. So also we need to recognize this is our spiritual identity. And the spiritual is more powerful than the natural. Because uh, everything in the natural is subject to the spiritual. And so we need to learn to live out of our spiritual identity uh, that we have in Christ. So that's about where we progressed uh, till, uh, till last week. So I just want to pause there and uh, just ask if anybody has any questions of um, what we did. I mean, I've just quickly reviewed. Any questions, uh, any things you want me to clarify, anybody? Everybody's, uh, everybody's been following this this so far. Everything is okay. Yeah, we just did a quick review. So, and. Uh, and we will be more than happy to answer those questions. Go ahead, Debbie. I see you've uh, raised your hand up. I will pause sharing and we'll take your question. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Master. Uh, my question is, uh, when we say to live out of the spiritual into the natural, so uh, like, um, you know, how do we apply it in our lives? Like, Love, live out of the spiritual into the natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So, so what we will learn is that there are certain ways um, by which this we, which God has given to us in the Bible, by which we can bring we can, there are certain things we can do to cause the spiritual to bear upon the natural. So, for instance, uh, and we can look at it in, in you know, different areas of our life, but let's pick a few examples. For instance, if somebody speaks and says something about us, you know, say you, about me, about any one of us, you know, somebody says something and it's negative. Now, if I want, I can believe what they say. I can listen to what they say. Or I can choose to believe who I am in Christ and take hold of that example. If somebody you know, so, oh, you know, you're, you, you're not going to amount. To choose to take hold of the word and the word of God says, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. The word of God says, God always causes me to triumph in Christ. The word of God says that I am born of God and I overcome the world. So instead of listening to what they are saying, I'll say, you know, I don't have to tell them, but to me, between me, God and against the devil, I said, no, I reject what they're saying. I believe God's word. I believe my identity I am who I am. My, who I am in Christ is who I really am. Right? So I don't let what people say define my self-image and what I think about myself. But I let the word of God and who I am in Christ and the life I have in him define what I think about myself. That's one example. That means we are forming our self-image, our confidence, everything based on our identity in Christ, what God has said about who we are in Christ. One example. Another example could be when we are facing challenges in life. 
you know, maybe something unexpected happens. You know, we, we say, oh, there's a storm or there's a challenge, there's a difficulty, whatever. It may be a financial problem. It may be, uh, you know, what people are causing, anything, something unexpected happens in life. In that situation, I am not perturbed. I am not disturbed. But in that situation, I say, God, doesn't matter what's happening. Your word says that you always cause me to triumph in Christ. So in this situation, I'm expecting to come out victorious. I'm not denying that there's a storm. I'm not denying that there may be a mountain in my way. I'm not denying that there may be a big challenge, but I am just choosing to live out of who I am in Christ. That in Christ, God always causes me to triumph. So then, when I do that, I'm walking by faith. And then God, that gives God an opportunity to work in my life situation. Now, sometimes, if a believer does not know this, what, what would their response be? And I'm just speaking normal, you know, naturally. So a believer finds themselves in a very difficult, oh, oh God, why am I going through this? Maybe God is angry with me. Oh, I'm going to suffer and all that. Instead of living out of what God has done for us in Christ, they live a very, a life like a victim, a life that is subject to the circumstances. You know, that's another, you know, just an example. So like this, you know, we can think of various situations in life when it comes to dealing with sin there's so many believers who are trapped in sin and they may be believers for many years but uh, uh, they have not seen victory in their lives over sin over habits over things so they could just say oh i have to live like this the rest of my life or if they know the truth and one of the truths that we learn is that the, in christ the power of sin over our lives is broken so what we do, we say, no, that's the truth. Sin will not have dominion over me. I'm not going to let any of these things control me. And what happens when they begin to live out of their life in Christ, they begin to walk victorious over sin. So these are just some examples that, and this is what we mean, we have to live out of this truth. And that means we, we speak the, what God has said, we act on that word and that word becomes a reality in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. All right. So let's go forward uh, from where we stopped. Uh, we're going to, I'm just share the notes here. So um, all of us can uh, see and, uh, uh, you know, just follow with me. So, this is um, in the PDF that we gave last week. So this mystery, so this, this whole truth, the reason we say it's a revelation is because Paul writes about this and he uses the word, the mystery, the mystery of his will. That means this was something God had planned to do, but he kept it like a secret, a mystery. And of course, this mystery is Christ. Christ himself is the mystery of God. And everything that unfolded through Christ is part of this mystery. So this revelation of our identity in Christ is part of this mystery that in the fullness that, that you know, God made it known or God revealed it to um, the apostles, you know, at the right time. So this was head, kept secret. God had already planned it before the foundation of the world, but he had kept it secret until the time came. He says, okay, I'm going to unveil this secret. So Christ came. He was the mystery of God to us, unveiled to us. And everything that God unfolded in Christ, God began to reveal and say, this is what I've done for you. This is what I've done for you in Christ. And so, you know, uh, again, Paul writes in Ephesians 3, that by revelation, God made known to him the mystery. Right? So God revealed this mystery to the Apostle Paul. 
So like I said, this mystery has to do with Christ and to everything God would unfold in Christ. And so he explains this to us. Part of this mystery was revealed by the Spirit to the apostles and prophets. He says that. And what is the part of that mystery? The Gentiles should be fellow heirs. The Gentiles would also be saved. And they would come into the same body, right? And they would partake of the promise in Christ. So notice that word there, that phrase again, in Christ. He says, you know, Gentiles would be brought in, people would be brought in, and we will all share in this promise in Christ. So this in Christ, what God was going to give to us in Christ is part of this mystery, which has been put for us in the Holy Scriptures. And so that's what we are studying. We are, we are saying, okay, God, May our eyes be opened to know this mystery so that you know, we can understand it and we can live out of it. So uh, as we mentioned last week in that same chapter in Ephesians 1, the apostle is praying. Apostle Paul prays. He tells uh, Ephesians, you know, I'm making mention of you in my prayers. So he says, look, I'm praying for you. And what is he praying? He says that God, the Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So I want God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That means the Holy Spirit has to unveil this to us, right? So for each one of us, as we journey through this course, we're saying, Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Help me to understand this. Right, and uh, so Paul prays here. Now he says, I pr "I'm praying for this." Uh, what what should be? He, he mentions four things. He says, "I want you to know Him, uh, that you may know the hope of His calling. I want you to know the hope of His calling. I want you to know the riches of His inheritance in the saints, and I want you to know the greatness of His power towards us who believe." Right? So he says, I want you to know these four things. I want you to know him. I want you to know the, the future, the hope he has called you to. I want you to know the inheritance he's made available. And I want you to know the great power that's towards us who believe. Right? So that's what we are, are, are journeying to understand. These, these things, the inheritance that God has given to us. Right? So... Uh, as part of this revelation, right, we must understand our human spirit. You know, we are all spirit, soul, and body. Our human spirit has seven functions, at least. Seven functions. So the human spirit has what we refer to as a function of conscience, which is to tell us what's right and wrong. It has a function of knowing. That means our spirit has to receive revelation knowledge, like how we educate our mind. In some way, we have to you know, educate or grow in knowledge in our spirit. Our human spirit has the ability to commune with God. Uh, the human spirit is a container of the life, nature, and power of God. So God has put things into our spirit. The human spirit also carries the identity. So this is who God has made us to be. And so we have to learn to live out of that. In the spiritual realm, when the spiritual realm looks at you, they see you as who you are in Christ. See, in the natural, when people look at you, they know who you are. Or you are, you know, you, have, you are so-and-so, you live in this place, uh, this is your family, etc. But in the spiritual, your human spirit has an identity. And the identity you carry in the spiritual realm is who you are in Christ. That's the identity. And the spiritual world recognizes that. And that's you know, something important for us to know that in the spirit, this is who I am. And therefore, there are things I can do from the realm of the spirit to affect the natural world, to affect things that are happening here on earth. I can do this because I have an identity. You know, our human spirit can also take action uh, by believing. We pray, we intercede, we speak words of faith, we exercise our faith. That's taking action. And our human spirit also grows. So seven functions of the human spirit. Uh, we will study about this later in our second year in depth. I've just outlined this for us here. But in our second year, we'll 
you know, talk about each of these in detail and, uh, and we'll get into it, All right? But what I want to emphasize is this knowing part. We have to grow in revelation, right? That means our human spirit needs to grow in knowledge. Just as our mind, the natural, we keep on learning things. In the spiritual, our human spirit needs to be filled with revelation knowledge, with the knowledge of the truth of the word of God, right? And knowledge comes through, revelation comes through perception and illumination, right? That means we, have, we need eyes who, that can see, but we also need light that comes from the Holy Spirit, right? If you have light, but if our eyes are not opened, then it's no use. Or if our eyes are open, but if there's no light, you're not going to be able to see things clearly. So we have to pray and say, God, open my eyes and help me to receive the illumination that comes from the Holy Spirit. So when, when we have perception and illumination, we will be able to receive revelation of God's word and our spirit is able to grow. Right? So um, here again, uh, I just mentioned here that Paul once again talks about this mystery has been hidden from ages and from generations. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. But now has been revealed to his saints. So look at that. Now has been revealed to his saints. God wants all of his saints, all of his people to know this revelation. What he has revealed, what he has put in the scriptures, he wants all his people to know. Right? So I want to encourage each of us, you know, we need to learn these truths and we need to share it with others and say, this is who we are in Christ. So one of the things, uh, this is um, maybe just one or two more points here on this. Um, one of the things that we must understand is we need to grow in knowledge, right? So Paul writes about the new man uh, in Colossians 3, uh, verses 9 and 10. He says, you've put off the old man and you put on the new man, and it says something about the new man. It's being renewed in knowledge. So the new man is constantly being renewed it's, it's in knowledge, according to the image of God who created it. Right. So that means it's, it's, it's continuously being receiving knowledge uh, about God and what he has done for the new man. The Passion Translation puts it like this. For you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. So we are, you know, we are progressing in this revelation of God. And as you're progressing in this revelation of God, the inner man is also, you know, being growing into that likeness and becoming more and more like Jesus. Right. So uh, uh, the goal of the study is to really receive revelation uh, of who we are in Christ and grow into becoming more and more like Christ. So we're going to get into section two. We're going to talk, talk, start talking about the new man. Uh, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Uh, anybody has any questions at this time? Anyone? Everyone's following me? Everyone's? Yeah. Good, good. Okay. So we're going to go forward now. We're going to get into the next chapter here. And I'll share the PDF so we could follow along, right? So let's start. Talk, let's spend some time understanding a few things about the new creation. Right? Could somebody read these seven? Could somebody please read out loud for us? It's unusual. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
old things have passed away behold all things have become new now all things are of god who has reconciled us to himself through jesus christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation okay thank you okay thank you, thank you. all right all right okay so now these verses are very familiar to many of us you know uh, we we read them often but we want to understand what these scriptures say right it says if anyone is in christ so that's what we're talking about being in christ right but now it says if anyone so that's good news right that means it's for all of us doesn't matter who we are it doesn't matter uh, you know what our background is this is for everybody if anyone that's good news but then how did we get into christ you know how did how did we start that life in christ uh what does it mean to be in christ what does it mean we want to understand that right if anyone is in christ he is a new creation what is that you know what is a new creation and uh, what does it mean because uh, we can look at ourselves and say well you know uh, before i received christ you know i i looked like this and i was so so tall and i was you know like that and after i prayed the prayer of salvation i, I was still the same i still looked the same i was the same height and whatever what is this new creation about you know and it says all the things all the things have passed away what does it mean for all the things to pass away right uh for some people some old things may be still troubling them so they're like hmm uh why is why are some old things still troubling me right how can i get free from those old things and it says here all things have become new well what does that mean what does it mean for all things to become new and it also says all things are of god what does that mean right so we want to spend some time here trying to really understand this so this is foundational for all the details we get into right and maybe can we have this can ask him and then they're going to delve into all the bits and pieces so who we are in Christ uh, create a picture of our identity of our inheritance and then you're going to say okay this is how you live out of this and this is how you can live victoriously out of this right so uh, like we emphasized already anyone can come into Christ right uh anyone is welcome anyone can have this privilege of being in christ now uh he said he also says if anyone is in christ he's a new creation so jesus is talking about this new life uh, he, sorry paul is mentioning new life and when we go back into the teachings of jesus we find that jesus already spoke about new life right he just put it in a different way he said unless a man is born again unless a man is born again he cannot see the kingdom of god this is in john chapter 3 and verse 3 says so you need to be born again now that word born again uh uh it simply means to be born from above you know it means to be born from above or born anew so he says unless you're born from above or born anew so jesus already spoke about this you know he said you need to be born from above you need to be born anew so we can understand here that this new life that jesus is talking about is a life that comes from 
above. It comes from God. And uh, Jesus already, you know, mentioned about this new life to us, even before Paul wrote, becoming a new creation. Jesus said, when you're born from above, you're born anew, or you have this new life. And that's what enables you to be part of the kingdom. But Jesus also indicated to us that this is being born of the Spirit. So this being born again, which means to be born from above, to receive right from God from above, which means to be born anew, also means to be born of the Spirit. I mean, this is a work that the Holy Spirit does. And sure enough, when the scriptures were written for us, you know, these things were addressed. Uh, the Bible says that when we receive him, he gives us the right to become children of God. This is John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Uh, and we are not born of blood or the will of the flesh, but we are born of God. So, how do we receive this new life? Well, we receive him. We welcome Jesus as Lord, as Savior of our lives. And we say, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I believe in you. I believe in what you've done. I give my life to you. And then what happens? He gives us this life from above. And we are born of God. At that moment, what happens? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit bring new life into us. First Peter one twenty three says, "We are born again. We are born again. How? By the Word, by the Word of God. So we are born again by the Word." And then Titus chapter three verse five says that we are regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. So there are two things that happen. We hear the word of God, and at that moment when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes, and through the action of the word of God, and through the action of the Holy Spirit, we are born again, or we are regenerated and renewed, made new through the word and through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So that's what this new creation, that's what, how it happens to us. Jesus spoke about it. And how it happens is when we hear the word and we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit works in us and he gives us new life and he renews us and makes us new creation. Right? Now, we are going to delve, delve into this uh, a little bit more. How did we get into Christ? So we ask that question. What the Bible is telling us is this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Could somebody read that for us? Uh, you could read both from the New King James and the Good News Bible, what we have here in the notes. Can somebody read it for us? But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus, and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. By him we are put right with God. We become God's holy people and are set free. Mm, thank you. So, notice what it says here. But of him you are in Christ Jesus. That's what we are studying. So you'll find this phrase, in Christ Jesus, so many places. We already see it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We saw it several times in Ephesians chapter 1. Now we're seeing it again in 1 Corinthians. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Or, what does that mean? It says, God brought you. God brought you into union with Christ Jesus. So God brought you. This is a work of God. A preacher can't do this for you. A pastor can't do this for you. Church membership can't do this for you. But God brought you into Christ. So at the time when we said yes to Jesus, received Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and the, when we heard the word of God and the Holy Spirit worked in us, giving us new life, what happened? God 
brought us into union with Christ Jesus. And in this one verse, he gives us a little glimpse of what it means to be in Christ. Or, you know, and, 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 and we will we will explain a lot of this in the weeks to come, but he gives us a little glimpse. He says, because you're in Christ, Christ becomes for us. Christ becomes, or God made Christ to be. So when God brought you into Christ, and you are in Christ, it means all who Christ is becomes yours. So to be in Christ, to be in union with Christ, means all who Christ is becomes mine. Because he says, you are in Christ Jesus, who, that is Christ, became for us. And then he gives a few things. Wisdom from God, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. And that is not a complete list, obviously, because Christ is more than just wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Jesus is much more than that. But what, the, what he's telling us is, as God brought you into Christ, you're in Christ, and when you're in Christ, all who Christ is becomes yours. Christ is wisdom that's available to you. Christ becomes your wisdom. Christ is righteousness that's available to you. Christ becomes your righteousness. Christ is the great sanctifier that becomes yours. You are sanctified in him. Christ becomes your sanctification. Christ is the great redeemer that becomes yours. Christ is your redemption. In him you are the redeemed. So this is a very powerful verse. Very simple. Very powerful. God brought us into Christ. And Christ becomes for us everything he is. He becomes wisdom from God. He becomes our righteousness. He becomes our sanctification. He becomes our redemption. He becomes our healer. He becomes our deliverer. He becomes our victor. He becomes our provider. Everything Christ is becomes yours because you are in Christ. So how did we get into Christ? God brought you into union with Christ Jesus, right? The, the next thing, and let's just read this before we go for a break. Could somebody read Ephesians 2 to 10 for us, please? Go ahead, go ahead. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Notice it says, we are his workmanship. That's we are something God is doing. Um, the Greek that actually is poema, that means we are God's poetry, is what he's saying. Or we are God's uh, work of art. So we are his workmanship. We are God's artwork, work of art, poetry. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now that phrase again, in Christ Jesus, that's what we've been talking about, who we are in Christ. But I just want to emphasize, and we will come back to many of these verses over and over again, but I just want to emphasize the word created. Created. So when God put us in Christ, he created us in Christ. To be, to, to be created is different from just being remodeled. To create means you're bringing something into existence that didn't exist before. To renovate or to remodel means you are just taking something that's already there and just, you know, maybe painting it afresh or, you know, giving it a little touch up. So God didn't just give us a touch up and put us into Christ. No, he created us in Christ. That means something that didn't exist came into existence. That's why we are a new creation. 
And for us to become new creation, the old had to be completely gone. So I want you to understand this. You are created in Christ, meaning something completely new. The old has no more claim over your life or my life. The old is gone. And we are created in Christ Jesus. That means we became something we were not earlier. What did not exist came into existence when we came into Christ Jesus. Okay. So I'm going to pause here. It's our break time. I just want to give you enough time for you to go for your break. And uh, uh, have a quick break. And then when we come back, you know, feel free to ask your questions if you have any doubts. So welcome to do that. And then we will continue. Okay. So I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 